So we can move to the next speaker, uh, Lorenzo Albanello, uh, about uh, lysosome, aesthetic biology approach to treat age-related macular degeneration. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Lorenzo Albanello. I present in the data that I produced at the Sense Foundation Research Center and um, working on the Lysosense project, trying to find remedies against age-related macular degeneration. Uh, my talk is in this session because I've been working very tightly with um, Jacques Mathieu. He gave me a lot of suggestions. We shared some constructs and we worked a little bit together. So this disease is very uh, problematic. Actually affects two million Americans at the moment. It affects 10% of people 60, uh, 75 to 85 and up to 30% of people older than 85. It actually is caused by this accumulation of this pigment in the retinal pigment epithelial lysosomes. And as you may see in that picture of the eye, Actually, more than half of the internal lumen of the eye is, constitutes the retina, but only the macular is the more, more important part because it's where we have, we have the major part of our father's actors. And at the middle of the macula, we have the fovea, that's a little circle of just one millimeter diameter that actually uses more than 50% of our um, visual cortex here. That's what happens when you have this disease. Unfortunately, you, used, um, you lose the visual in the center of your visual field, you lose the capacity to see what's happening. So there are two types of AMD. There's the dry form that's recognizable because it has this accumulation, this yellowish drusen that are cell debris and only affects, uh, I mean, actually affects 90% of people with the disease. But its symptoms are not as severe as the ones that we have here in the wet form. Only 10% of the patients but we have this new formation of vasculature on top of the retina that actually makes the vision even fuzzier. So most of the research is actually on this one. In this next picture, you can see actually a section of a healthy macula. So what happens is that you have photoreceptors. You can see the inner and outer segments of rods and cones. And uh, then there's the retinal pigment layer. And a little bit down, there's the choroid. So the choroid is the vascularized layer. It's where you have all the uh, capillaries. So as you may see here, actually cones and roads get their oxygen and food from the choroid through the RP. So the RP is an essential layer. When it's dysfunctional, unfortunately, it causes blindness. As you may see, with all these phagosomes, what happens is that the RP layer does a lot of metabolism for photoreceptors. And, uh, anabolizes, catabolizes a lot of compounds, especially vitamin A that's essential for vision. A lot of our colleagues are trying to find strategies to find therapies against this disease. The interesting thing is, is that most of them are mainly trying to, first of all, focus on the wet form because it's a little bit more severe and they're mainly trying to do that using antibodies against VEGF, so stopping the formation of new vessels. Uh, somebody is using like anti-inflammation drugs. The ones that we like more at Science Foundation are the ones that have a regenerative approach and trying to use it in stem cells. Uh, we have, we share that idea, we're trying to eradicate the root of the problem instead of just hunting the symptom. So HUE, as Janet Sparrow, Columbia University, Brinkley Lee showed a few years ago, is this funny molecule that builds up in RP cell isosome. It's charged in one part, has two hydrophobic chains, and it's actually formed in the visual cycle. So as I told you, as everybody knows, vitamin A is essential for vision. During the visual cycle, there is this phosphatidyl ethanolamine that's formed and is automatically hydrolyzed to HV. And this is toxic for several reasons. It interferes with the proton pump. So it's been demonstrated that actually RP cell lysosomes that are filled with HV have a higher pH. So all the catabolism is shut down in some way and they, a lot of toxic compounds uh, build up has the tergen-like properties, obviously, because it's hemophilic, so it disrupts less solar membranes, and it's photosensitive. That's the most important thing, because eyes, what eyes do is actually capturing light, and light, especially blue light, is very toxic, forms apoxides, and uh, the apoxides are mutagen, so that's why HVs are our main enemy for this disease. 
So has George Lunder and a few other friends, a few of them are sitting here, published recently, we found a series of enzymes that can degrade A3 and that can produce catabolic products that are a lot less toxic. So we have a double approach trying to do that. We make some enzymes in microorganisms with some engineered drug delivery system in a way that they find some receptor in RP cell membrane and start an endocytic pathway. We also transfect RP cells to teach them in some way how to get rid of their I2 by themselves. And that's interesting because in that way we're trying to test the gene therapy approach. It's an interesting thing because there are several clinical trials at the moment that are trying to um, study uh, gene therapy in RP cells and they're working pretty good for an important reason because the eye is an immune privileged eye um, organ like other three organs as well so your immune system doesn't work as well in the eye they have a different immunity because um, they can the eyes can get inflamed or could pop so what happens is that you won't have a lot of antibodies trying to inactivate the synthetic enzymes or the alien compound as the FDA likes calling it so what happens is that it's easier to do gene therapy in the eye so we're trying that as well so for the first case, we have two approaches, two sub-strategies. We use the manosylation. So to do that, we express the enzymes in PK pastoris, that it's a yeast that has, has this peculiarity of adding a lot of mannose groups to some amino acids. So we changed a little bit the amino acidic structure, we express that in PK pastoris, and we achieve a, a exocyte, endocytosis. I can't talk about that for time. I'll talk about more about the GIL tag. GIL tag means glycosylation independent lysosomal <coughs> targeting. Jeff Grubb talked about it two years ago here at Sense4. It's a very interesting and very effective way. So we had this little tag of a few dozen amino acids at the end terminal part of the protein. It targets different receptors, but it still triggers a very um, well working lysosome endocytosis. So here's what I did, uh, what we did. Actually, put together this construct with the gill tag that you can see in green. The dummy gene is the part in red, is where I could put all of my genes that can degrade E2E next to a flag tag that I use for actually immunofluorescence, western blot, stuff like that, <coughs> and also some protease sites to get rid of the tags that could probably impede uh, the activity of the enzymes. I expressed in the, like, Rosetta E. coli strain in an hour after the induction very easily these <coughs> enzymes. They work good. You can see different concentration, different times after the induction. Here's what happened when I fed for 30 minutes, 20 micrograms per milliliter, this couple of proxydases as, as an example in the growth media. I checked the cells in an inverted fluorescent microscope and there was a clear and clean lysosomal targeting of my enzymes compared to the controls that just didn't show anything. The controls were just all kind of like the nuclear part that we can see there. It's interesting because these cells are post-metallic, they're confluent, so they have their lysosomes in a perinuclear location as you would expect. So there was a little complication actually because expressing those real quick in E. coli, I forgot to put a couple of factors actually, been published like in 1997, that are actually disulfidosome raises and chaperone proteins that send the translation and the folding of the protein periplasmic interstice in the E. coli. That's essential. So these enzymes now making, I will be making it also with those factors, but the way I made them that now we're not active anymore in vitro, uh, fixing that problem. So uh, Gibson assembly, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. This guy, Dan Gibson, changed my cloning life in some way. He published this pretty straightforward method in 2009 uh, for assembling um, genes in constructs all together. It's nice, how does it work? You basically linearize <coughs> PCR out your insert out of some vector you had it in. You also make a linearization through PCR of your construct. The important thing is that both the vector and the product must have these two parts that are exactly the same. You put everything together in this isothermal mix. What happens? Isothermal is mainly, mainly, mainly based on PEG 8000, and it has inside fusion polymerase, the TAC uh, exonuclease, only five grams. So what happens is this. You put the exonuclease, it actually cuts and eats so it's only one shred and makes it sticky with the other one in the insert there will be some annealing happening, there will be some fusion polymerase filling the gap, and you also put uh, five times more concentrated TAC ligase that will close and stop everything, and in 15 minutes you have everything put together. 
What's really interesting about this method is that for our mm, research against age-related macular degeneration, we can do several things. We can do everything in 48 hours, actually between PCR and screening through sequence. And so from the moment you receive the primers to the moment you have the sequence, it's just a couple of days. You can have no restriction scars. That's very interesting because actually I'm using several genes in the same construct. And why do I want to translate also those unwanted amino acids that will, be, will have to be there uh, if I want to use you know, restriction sites? And there's the possibility of combinatorial pressure. That's really interesting because I want to put my tags in different positions sometimes. I want to try some medium throughput approach. And with the assembly method, it's very good because you just order, you have to do just a little bit more planning, order different primers, and putting, sticking all these parts in different positions. So this is what happens. I did the assembly, I linearized them. I've seen uh, here, so there are five anti three enzymes, and as an example, I found that they had, except this one, they had different sizes. So I said, okay, what happened? Let me just screen, um, like sequence screen, just three of them. So what happens in this case is that four of these five enzymes had two or three colonies that were good. Only one, this versatile proxidase had only one. So actually with a pretty cheap and fast cleaning, it works. It worked out, it was very good. I did the transfection using actually five different transmission methods because RP cells are a little hard to transfect. I mean, the best people that published best uh, efficiency didn't go over 12% transfection. The transfection worked. The problem is that there was a little bit of toxicity. Here I used the same construct that um, Jacques talked about. So actually we took out the tram, the, actually the, in, the luminal part of lamp one. So we had two lamp one tails that helped actually targeting and um, anchorage in the left zone membrane. I also had GFP, but just on the um, cytoplasmic side. And uh, so now there will be different, um, like transfection will be carried out using a different option. So what we want to do now is actually putting our enzymes next to the gill tag also here, because it's interesting for the gene therapy approach, we, because we can teach those cells actually to produce the enzymes, gill tag, exocytosis, and when you do a gene therapy, you probably don't target exactly 100% of cells. But if the enzyme is exocytose, that could also be curative in some way for the other cells. So we'll target the same uh, receptors and we'll work also in other cells. A3, A3 is not commercially available. Uh, we had to make it, as Chance Power also published. We did synthesis purification, it was really good. Um, what happens? Uh, using that, we could actually test through HPLC how our enzymes are good at degrading it. What's interesting, and what I put together thanks to the help of Lisa at the in, in, in plant here, uh, is actually putting together a new, uh, like, HV quantitation assay using a fax scan. So everybody publishes, okay, you have to do fractionation, less some enrichment, HPLC, you put the old cells in a blender. Uh, it's not actually true. HV is very fluorescent. So what I actually did uh, was this thing, actually. I put all these cells in, um, in the fax scan using, uh, trying to find actually the, the emission of fluorescence on the P spectrum. Uh, I mean, that's actually a logarithmic scale. But what you see here, zero molar, 100 micromolar, 200, 400, 800 and 1.6 millimolar, you can see total <coughs> linear relation between the amount, uh, that connects the amount of HV in the actual growth media and the actual emission that we have. So it's a very fast method for us to try to test how much, first of all, how much A3 is killing our cells, how much A3 degradation, enzymatic degradation products are still toxic to our cells, and above all, how much our enzymes are degrading A3 inside our cells. So the following steps will be to try these new transfections and uh, to see what happens. And uh, this is pretty much what happened in the, few, in the last few months. Thank you, I would like to thank Science Foundation for this brilliant So we have time to take a few questions. Maybe my knowledge is outdated on the subject, but I think in many cases, uh, macular de degeneration is one of the many smokers' diseases. So their prevention is the trick. And I remember also a report in maybe the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago 
that they found viral fragments in the lesions of the macula, and they even came up with a suggestion that the cure would be vaccination in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that may be additional, of course, to your approach, but it also suggests that there are various way that, ways that lead to Rome. Well, uh, we tend to think, I mean, it's pretty clear from some published articles that HV might be really toxic. So what happens is that HV is actually found in those lysosomes and it permeabilizes lysosomes and causes a lot of downstream toxicity effects. A lot of doctors, actually, when you go to them with age-related macular degeneration, they mainly still now tend to teach you how to try to see with the peripheral part of your eye they try to give you like orange glasses that will keep blue light from breaking down into even worse. There are interesting like vaccination approaches, but also actually also the antibodies against VEGF that could stop the wet form from being so severe are working in some way. I really like how a lot of uh, colleagues are trying to find the therapy. The problem is that I am of the opinion that considering how toxic A2E is, and if you put in gross media, you have, I also didn't talk about it, but we also did a PI staining to understand how many of those cells were apoptotic. A2E is really toxic, and your eyes, <coughs> like automatically, as a normal consequence of doing what they have to do, will have to accumulate that. <coughs> so it's probably a good idea also to try to eradicate A2E itself. Thank you, one more question. I didn't quite catch, uh, when you were comparing the mineral oscillation approach with the gilt tagging approach, were you saying that you hadn't tried the mineral oscillation approach? No. Or that you've tried it and you don't want to talk about it today? No, no, we, we, we tried that, and uh, Max has been working on it mainly. I uh, probably didn't have time in 10 minutes to also talk about that. The interesting thing uh, with the mineral oscillation approach is that, uh, first of all, it's not protected by any patent, so there's nothing to license, and that's interesting. Another interesting thing is that uh, it works pretty good and there are several groups that worked on it and it's easily, I mean, lysosomal targeting is easily achievable. With your enzymes? Or just yeah, with every enzyme. The good thing in, that, in our enzymes is that when you work on lysosomal storage diseases, the main problem is that, as everybody knows, the lysosome is a shredder and tries to shred everything it has. Our enzymes, fortunately, enzyme, fortunately, are pretty stable at low pH, up to three, actually. So we don't have the pH problem. We have the protease problem that always happens in, uh, actually, in lysos enzymes to lysosomes that are not lysosomes. So what I've also been planning, I didn't talk about it, is actually to make uh, two different versions of a proenzyme that would actually be inactivated also when it reached the lysosomes. Because what I've seen in those transfections was a huge toxicity effect, EDI and also lysosomal membrane permeabilization. I don't know if those enzymes were toxic also before reaching the, man, the lysosomes. When you talk about uh, horse radish peroxidase or enzymes like that, those are enzymes that like eating a lot of stuff. So we have to try also the pro-enzyme strategy and I'll, I will be doing that. Okay, uh, I have one more question. Is the macular degeneration associated with other ophthalmological disease or problems? Well, there are different versions, also like some genetic forms of uh, macular degeneration that are called differently, but mm, whenever we have a storage disease in RPS cells, lysosomes, we have similar symptoms like that. Okay, thanks again. Up here. So, um, um, perhaps you're aware of, of the work from Protalix. So Protalix is, a, is an Israeli company that has been making uh, a number of enzymes, particularly, particularly um, the serozyme uh, in carrot cells. Now they've purified it and it's been just recently, last week, approved by the uh, US FDA, okay? Which is very interesting, that's a completely different expression system. Most interestingly, they've taken the carrot cells and dried them and, and fed them to mice orally and about 10 to 15 percent of the enzyme is taken up, and because it's got plant glycosylation, it's it's taken up into the cells better than the, the purified material. So there may be a way to do this just with plant cells directly, just by eating the, the these enzymes. Yeah, I think that the glycosylation approach is definitely the most interesting one, and uh, I would love lessons to keep pursuing that type of research. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much.